Hello, welcome. My name is Asla Mullah. This is video two of my interview with a client, Doug Nelson. If you haven't watched the first video, the link will be shown now. The purpose of these videos is for Doug to share his experience going through a disciplinary hearing and a CCMA case, having won, and hopefully this will be of benefit to some of the viewers who are going through something similar. In our last video, we spoke about clarity on charges, how long should you be on suspension? What are your rights during suspension, etc.? The purpose of this video right now is to talk about the disciplinary hearing. What was it like? What were some of the pitfalls? And what were some of the unfair tactics that the employer used? Over to you now. Thank you. The, the problem is when you send a letter asking for clarity, they're going to give you clarity. And that generally means the employer is now being forced into a situation where they need to either charge you or let you back at work. Many small firms have decided that once you've suspended, you're actually out. They want you out the system anyway. You mean smaller companies? Smaller companies. So the decision, your disciplinary hearing is actually a formality more than anything else. The decision to terminate your services has already been made. Many of these... But hold on, let me just explain that part. What Doug is talking about is that even though the law gives employees the right to a fair hearing in South Africa, we find that in practice, the chairperson is often hired to actually dismiss the employee. It doesn't happen in all situations, but there is sometimes where the, the employee does not get a fair hearing at the disciplinary hearing stage. Unfortunately, it happened in Doug's case where he felt that uh, regardless of what evidence he was putting forward at the disciplinary hearing, the chairperson was just biased and was going to rule against him. But more on that directly from Doug. Thank you. The, the first step when I realized something was wrong is when the charge sheet was actually brought against me. The charges were vague, incredibly vague. One of them was um, misuse of company property, I think it was. It is so, what does that mean? It, it sounds like there's something, but you'd search your brain and you can't think of anything. So when they say, do you understand the charges? You say, no, not really, but they say, all right, but kind of, you understand, do you understand the English? And so yeah, I must use something that didn't belong to me. And so they will accept it, especially if it's a setter. The last charge that they had against me was something as breach of the employer-employee trust relationship. So in other words, my actions created a situation where the employer could no longer employ me. I was untrustworthy or the relationship was broken. For them to do that, which I understand is quite common, they um, rely a lot on innuendo and a lot of um, creating the impression in people's minds that I am an untrustworthy employee along those lines. And they will certainly push that narrative. What I found out is a lot of these labor consultants that work for these firms use that as a standard line. It is the easiest one to uh, motivate as you carry on into the disciplinary process. So what Doug is actually talking about here is that most labor brokers and labor consultants indicate that the trust relationship has broken down as a go-to charge when it comes to dismissing an employee. What happened in his particular case is that the employer was just having a mental breakdown, the business was going through some incredible difficulty, they're supposed to have taken other routes, but instead they chose to dismiss him without any proper grounds or evidence. So the chart sheet just was a whole bunch of baseless allegations. And, uh, and they wanted to catch it all up by saying that the trust relationship was broken down. While it's true in South African law that you must show the trust relationship has broken down for a dismissal to be fair, that cannot just be something you just throw on every dismissal and try hope it sticks on the wall. Oh, he did this. Or, oh, he did that. The allegations must be concrete and clear. For an employer to charge you in a disciplinary hearing, he must give you exact details what happened, when it happened, and at the hearing they must have proper evidence against you. They can't just take their chances. Correct. When the disciplinary hearing, because you only have 48 hours to prepare for these disciplinary hearings, They've also taken away all of your uh, tools to gather evidence. You no longer have access to the company's email. You no longer have access to your emails, your phone, your phone records. All of these things have actually been removed from you, yet you're expected to mount a defense in 48 hours. Another issue is that 
you're not allowed to contact the staff correct, uh, directly. So if they suspend you on a Friday or on a Thursday, for instance, and then your disciplinary hearing is on a Tuesday morning, so that in theory they've turned around and they said, well, we gave you 72 hours plus to prepare. In reality, you had two business days where you could actually contact the staff. You can only contact the staff by contacting your uh, superior and letting them know that I need to speak to A, B or C. That's a very important point that Doug mentioned. If you have been suspended, you are not allowed to make contact with other employees. Unfortunately, it's one of those mechanisms in our labor law. If you need any documents or witnesses, you must approach the formal process in your workplace. Either contact your boss or contact the HR department. The best is to do so in writing and ask them for the evidence that you need. It is a, I highly recommend that you do not contact witnesses independently, meaning don't message them privately or phone them. That would be used against you. So if you need any information from the company, put it down in an email and contact the HR or the boss directly. When the disciplinary hearing, um, just because you've asked for the information doesn't necessarily mean you get it either. That a lot of that stuff is dealt with the morning of your disciplinary hearing, where they say, here's that, here's that, or maybe they don't. It's really up in the air. And the main point that I took away from this is that the company has made the decision to fire me, get me out of the way. This is the one and only chance for me to actually gather evidence. So I went in and I installed the recording app on my phone. I, when I was there, I made sure to film the offices as much as possible, uh, to build up as much evidence as possible to prove where my desk was, to prove where other people's uh, that too. And most importantly, when the disciplinary hearing starts up, I asserted my right to record the meeting, to create my own minutes. The disciplinary um, um, process means that you are entitled to those minutes. But it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get there. By having a physical recording of the events in question, when you go to CCMA, it's not an if, it's a when you go to CCMA, you are armed with facts where you can prove that witnesses were not allowed, that the chairman was biased. Otherwise, it's very difficult. How do you prove the tone of the chairman when he said something? How do you do it? The easiest way is to actually record it. When you go into your disciplinary hearing, this is your last chance to gather real evidence on the facts of the situation. So viewers, based on today's video, what we've covered is the disciplinary hearing process of your case. There are some critical elements. Number one, if you're going through a disciplinary hearing, get as much information as you can. If you need information like documents, witnesses, go through the formal channels within your company. Number three, don't be afraid to ask questions in your disciplinary hearing. If you don't understand anything, say you don't understand anything. Explain your position and where you're coming from. Number four is be prepared for your disciplinary hearing. Even though there's a chance that the person who is hired to chair it is going to dismiss you, it's better to be prepared and put your best foot forward. You never know where you stand and whether you will actually get a fair hearing. As Doug mentioned, the next step is to approach the CCMA. That's going to be the title of our next video. Stay tuned and watch it soon. If, of course, if you need help in your particular situation, click the link below and book an appointment. I'll speak to you soon. Take care.